Good morning, church. If you have your Bibles, turn to the 10th chapter of 1 Corinthians. We're finishing chapter 10 this morning. So it's not been a great morning for us as a family. Um, a really close friend of ours, my son's best friend's father, passed away this morning, leaving behind seven children. And um, so it's been a hard, hard morning. So if you see me crying, it's not only because I love Jesus through His Scripture, but it's because I, I'm going to miss a dear friend. So if you think about praying for the Sullivan family this morning, uh, he was in charge of our men's ministry at our last church, and just a solid guy, solid guy, loving man, great family man. Uh, I'm not sure how they're doing financially with this problem and with this process, but please be in prayer for them. I'm just going to open up with prayer and allow the Spirit of God to speak this morning. Glorious Father, I thank you for your presence, and it's in moments like this, Lord, when we lose life that we understand how frail this life is. And regardless of the ways a person passes, the sad part is a person passes, someone we love, someone we care for, someone we rely on, someone we cherish. And God, I just pray that you be with the family be with uh, my boys, be with my wife as it's her best friend, and uh, be with the church in California that's struggling through yet another loss. Be with us, Lord, as we have our own loss here, our own stresses, our own problems. God, help us to intercede. Help us to dive into your scripture. Help us to not allow the secondary issues to derail us. God, I pray that we will focus in on what it means to be a Christ follower, focus in on what it means to follow after you, to live for you each and every day, to cherish the moments that we have with our families, but most of all, God, may your scripture speak clearly today, in Christ's name, amen. Now, to do a little bit of family business, what's great about Christ's community is the life groups tend to meet on Sundays. And the reason for this, the desired outcome for this, was for those that have busy lives all throughout the week, that you could come to a church and you can get into fellowship with other believers and you could drop your children off in the children's ministry and then dive into uh, a life group. And we've been trying to see what it would be like to expand the kingdom and to add more life groups during the week. But with the blessing that Sunday morning life groups are, there is a negative. And here's the negative. We have so many people involved in life groups that we have very limited people volunteering in ministries. So what I would ask for is if you could give up one Sunday, one Sunday a month to volunteer in, let's say, children's ministry or first impressions or coffee ministry or any of these other ministries, we would love for you to consider that. So if you feel like that might be something you can do as you're involved in life groups on a Sunday morning and attending a service, just write that on the back of your connection card so that the leaders of those ministries can uh, jump in. You will notice in children's ministry that they had to combine a couple classes because of the volunteers. And so if you're interested in jumping in in that way, please do so because we want to love on your kids and we want to make sure that there is space in the rooms for your kids to actually have uh, an, an invitation to get to know Jesus a little bit better without having to be totally blocked off with 20 different people in the classroom. So thank you. I know it's a little family business, but we got to take care of that because uh, the children's ministry and other ministries are looking for new volunteers. These last couple weeks, I have to say, have been some pretty heavy hitting sermons. They've been very deep, they've been very thought-provoking, they've been very convicting to a lot of people, and today will probably be one more to add to that number. So I just, I'd love to at least air it all out, so hopefully you can shake it off. However, what I will say is next Sunday, the topic is on head coverings. So I know you would know that this is a topic, you know, completely taking the church by storm these days on head coverings. But uh, Pastor PJ is definitely going to bring some perspective for us as we understand what head coverings were like in the Corinthian church. But there is going to be nuggets that we need to understand as a church in today's culture and context. Now, to recap just chapter 10 alone, you could probably break chapter 10 down and summarize into four sections. The first one is in verses 1 to 5. God gave the Israelites great privileges 
yet they were overthrown in the wilderness because of their sin. Paul was taking the church in Corinth all the way back into a history lesson to the Israelites, and they're wandering through the desert for 40 years and what took place there. In verses 6 to 14, God cautioned them against idols and the sinful practices of fashioning idols and following their lusts of their, their flesh. Verses 15 to 22, the partaking in idolatry cannot exist with having communion with Christ. You can't have communion with Christ and have communion with the demons all at the same time. That's what we talked about last week. And this morning, verses 23 to 33, may all we do be for the glory of God and without offense to the conscience, which is convictions, of others. Yay! This is what we get to talk about this morning. So grab your Bibles. We are in verses 23. Do all things to the glory of God. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Please underline those two sentences. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. It sounds like Jesus, right? It sounds like Jesus is preaching right now through Paul. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of your conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of your conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it. For the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I do not mean your conscience, but his. For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thanks, thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that which, for which I give thanks? So whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to the Jew or to the Greek or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ." So, Paul's goal for the last two chapters has been trying to teach the church of Corinth to go and spread the gospel, to go and save souls. That's the goal of the church. That's the purpose of the church. The problem with Corinth is they were struggling with their own inner conscience. They're struggling with the do's and the don'ts. They're struggling with all the rules. They're struggling with legalism, and that took their eyes off of the prize to go win souls. Now, you fast forward 2,000 years, this is where we are today in our church. In North America church and across the globe, we lose sight of God's glory, we lose sight of God's purpose, we lose sight of the focus of winning souls to present our own liberties, to present our own rights, to do what we want to do, and then it takes our eyes off of saving souls. So as Christians, we are called to live and act like Christ, right? Amen? Amen. So what does that look like? That means we are to bear His image in everything we say and everything we do. The job description is probably really self-explanatory. All you have to really do is read Jesus' writings and follow His writing. However, Galatians chapter 5, 22 to, 20, uh, to 23 gives a really good description for the Christ follower. Most of you guys know this, but just in case you don't, it's the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit is what? Yeah, it sounded very depressing. <laughs> like it didn't sound like you were really excited about this job description, right? It was like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and it's what I'll do if I have to. That's what it sounds like. But this should be an exciting job description, right? So we read this over and we go, yes, I think I could do that, especially with the Spirit's leading. Love. That means I get to love my enemy. It means I get to love my neighbor means I get to love the person that doesn't think or act like me. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against those things there is no law. Now here's the problem. What we do is we compartmentalize this job description. And we go, sometimes I'll have love, but I'm not going to be kind today. It's not fruits of the Spirit. It's fruit of the Spirit. That means it's all-encompassing. Right? So we can't partake with communion with Christ and partake with communion with demons. 
is Paul's point. So we have to flow through this daily. Fun times. As Christians, we're called to be kind. We're called to be courteous and offer such actions to those who might differ from us in religious sentiments and practices. Now guess what? What we choose to do in our home is probably very different than the unbeliever. But just because we do something different in our home doesn't mean we get to go project it on an unbeliever when they invite us over. That's his point. Now we're going to unpack that here in just a minute. As we surrender our rights, are we surrendering our rights to win souls? We're not called to be in sin or to compromise our, our Christ-likeness. That's not at all what Paul's saying. But there are things you can and choose to do that ne- not necessarily are sin, but to project that on other people, that's the problem. Paul wants the church in Corinth not to use their liberties or freedoms to hurt other people. Now, it is thinking of our neighbor as more important than ourselves. And in these last two chapters, Paul really is wanting the church to understand what it means to eat and drink, and that all that we do, we should aim at the glory of God, at pleasing and honoring Him first, not ourselves. And a holy, peaceable, and benevolent spirit can and will disarm the greatest of enemies. So when we are actually functioning like a Christ follower, it brings down the tension of other people when we're doing it the right way. But if we come in guns blazing with our rights and our freedoms, what does that do? It builds up the wall. So what does this mean for the church? What does this mean for the church of Corinth? What does this mean for our church? That we do not have a series of do's and don'ts to comply with as believers. Do you remember uh, star charts as a child? Do you remember like chore charts? Okay, so it was me and my sister, and my sister had her chores to do and I had my chores to do and my dad thought it was a great idea to have a star chart and that if you did something with and you did it to your whole heart without grumbling and complaining and you did it right you get a star right so my sister was the pleasable one in the family and so all week long she had stars gold stars all the way down my dad came up with another tier system that you might not necessarily get a gold star but you'll get a silver star if you partially participated correctly right so hers are all gold and i had maybe one gold a couple silvers and then a bunch of empty spots right because that was just the way i was as a child now this is the do's and don'ts of christianity if you do this i reward you if you don't do this i reject you and i take it back so there were moments that i messed up and i acted out and i was upset or i or, or i yelled at my sister or I talked back to my parents and my dad would get a sharpie marker and he would go to whatever gold or silver star I had left and he would color it in. So now I got a black spot all over my silver and gold star. Well, what does that do to a child, right? Is this what Christ does to his, his children? Well, let's unpack this for a few moments. What do we do with the Word of God? The Word of God is an outline for how to live. So if we read Scripture correctly, we would actually know how to handle things. I'm held to an account by God first. You're held to an account by God first. This is great news. And what God's Word outlines is what I am held to an account for first. So even as a pastor, I'm held to an account to God first, and I'm held to an account for His Word first. Not everybody else. Now I know this is interesting. Because you're like, well, wait a second. We're a church that votes for you, right? We're a congregational voting church. Well, if it was the gospel according to everyone else, what would it look like as a pastor having to stand up to everyone else in the congregation based off of their opinions and their ideals and their agendas? It would be a little bit awkward. Versus God's word and God's ideals and God's agenda right? So I'm not saying I'm not held to an account by you as the body, but what I am saying is I'm held to account by God and his word. And I hope that you would hope for that as well versus me holding you to an account for everything I think you should do rather than what the word of God is telling you to do. Let me unpack that just for a few moments. The word of God is the parameter. 
Everything that I can do or you can do as a Christ follower is the parameters around the Word of God. But I'm held to an account for that, not everyone's opinions. Thank God. Because if that were the case, we would have a bunch of churches that are completely splitting. Today, we find a lot of Christians that find themselves spiritually exhausted. And it's not easy, or it's not hard to realize why. They're on burnout or simply no longer filled with the same zeal and excitement that they had when they experienced the peak of their faith. The reason for this is because we've come to confuse discipline and discipleship in Christ and His Word with legalism. And when legalism creeps in, that takes the air right out of the spiritual sails. Versus fanning into flame God's Word and God's presence. Legalism, or the Bible, the Word of God, leads us to being disciplined and discipled into the image of Jesus. That's the point of uh, discipleship. How do, how do we know this? Look at Jesus' ministry. What did Jesus do? He was devoted to exposing religious legalism and inviting everyone into a personal relationship with God through Him, not a list of do's and don'ts. For instance, let's just kind of go on some old school uh, stories of, of Jesus. Jesus hung out with sinners. Pharisees would call them scum. That's who Jesus fellowshiped with. He would have dinner with them. He would drink wine with them. And while he was there, do you think he was giving them a list of do's and don'ts? Do you think he's like, well, actually, you should really do this. I choose not to do that because I am of God. I don't know why you're doing this. We don't really have a whole lot of records and accounts of that kind of terminology and phrasing from Christ. So what did he do differently than what legalism does. I don't know. He built relationship with them and asked them thought, heart-provoking questions. Huh. What would it look like if we got rid of the do's and the don'ts in conversations and we came at people with heart-provoking questions? Let's unpack this. Christ was devoted to building relationships, not a religion. The Pharisees wanted to build a religion. Perhaps we've forgotten what this relationship is all about. And this is why there's a lot of people in the church that are like, you know what, I can't live up. I can't live up to the expectations of the people in the church. Because I do this, I get hit. I do this, I get hit. I do this, I get hit. And they're not even big deals. Like, I don't know what else to do. The difference is, although discipline and discipleship and legalism both concern doing good and not doing the bad, legalism sees the doing and not doing simply as the ends to themselves. Don't do that and God will love you. Stop doing that and God will love you. You do this more and God will love you. That's legalism. While discipline in Christ sees our ultimate sanctification, salvation, and satisfaction in God. It's not about the do's and the don'ts, it's about God. And what Paul is trying to teach to the church in Corinth is, look, it's about God. It's not about the meat. It's not about the drinking. It's not about that stuff. It's about God. In other words, legalism loves laws, and discipline and discipleship loves God. Big difference. And so if all I tell myself is, don't lie, don't lie, don't lie, James, don't lie, then the object in my mind is the very act of lying. And my heart's response is simply to abstain from lying. But if I begin to start telling myself, love God, love God, love God, then the object in my mind is God, and my heart's response is love to God. And when I do, then the abstinence of lying comes in, right? Because God needs to be the center, not lying, right? God needs to be the center, not the drinking. God needs to be the center, not the pot, right? Your focus on loving God naturally entails the abstinence of sin. But as focusing and abstaining on sin does not naturally entail the love of God. Let me unpack this. Abstaining from sin doesn't necessarily grow your love for God. Just because I'm not going to lie, I'm not going to lie, I'm not going to lie, doesn't necessarily mean I'm loving God. just means that in order to stop lying, that's when God, I believe, is going to love me. In fact, what is successfully abstaining from sin sometimes causes a greater deficiency in our very love for God because we view God through a different bad theology. That God's only going to love me if I don't do something. God's only going to love me if I do do something. 
It's because we've turned God into a quartermaster that smacks us every time we sin. And I'll tell you right now, that's bad theology. It's very toxic bad theology. And this is what the self-righteous legalists of the Sanhedrin were doing. And this is what Jesus would reject. So in rejecting the legalism, he was loving sinners. And sinners were coming to know him. It's beautiful. So let's play a little game. It's the do's and don'ts of Christianity. Who wants to play? Anybody want to play? Ding, 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 let's go. Legalism leads with law rather than the gospel. Don't drink that. Could lead you to sin. Don't eat that. It could lead you to sin. Don't listen to that. It's sin. Don't dance like that. Don't date. Don't hang out with those types of people. Don't wear that. Do not watch that, whatever you do. But instead, read your Bible more, pray more, garbage in, garbage out. Now, in some of those things, read your Bible, of course. That's a good thing. But if we're leading with that, what is that teaching people? Versus Christ-likeness leads with the gospel. So what does the gospel teach us? What would it look like instead of, don't do that, don't do this, do this, don't do that, if we led with something like this? How's your relationship with God doing lately? What a perspective shift. How are you responding to his leading? What is the last passage you read and what did you learn from it? What do you find yourself thinking about the most lately? How has your thought life been? What's one thing holding you back in life? How have you seen God show up lately? How do you know if you see God? What's the evidence? Like, do you see the difference? And it's, I'm hard-pressed to think that when Jesus was hanging out with sinners that he wasn't asking heart-provoking questions. Versus like, well, you know, the reason why you're having this problem is because you're drinking. You know why you're really having this problem is because on a Friday night, all you want to do is party. Why was Jesus continually being invited back to these parties? It's not because he was a buzzkill. It was because he was provoking their heart. Because guess what? Christ cares about the heart more than he cares about the action. Because the heart changes the action. Right? So that's the difference. God's plan is that the new life we now have in Christ grows in grace and in a knowledge of the Lord Jesus and that the beautiful character of Jesus is formed in us. Jesus forms us, not our do's and our don'ts. Because I'll tell you, the do's and the don'ts are seeking sand. And it'll only go out for a little bit and then all of a sudden you'll, you'll sink. And you'll wonder why the flame is burnt out because your flame is burnt on the do's and the don'ts rather than Christ. As we live our lives for the Spirit and in truth by submitting to the leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit, His Spirit changes our lives, not the rules. So the great thing is, is once we experience Jesus, His Holy Spirit is now in us and that's what leads to the change. Where it's like, wow, why am I doing that? Not because somebody told me, but because it was like the Holy Spirit just bubbled up inside of me. So we talked about this a couple weeks ago with the woman at the well. Do you think her life was changed after meeting Jesus? Absolutely. He didn't go, stop having affairs. Stop marrying a bunch of men. Stop doing this. He didn't do any of that stuff. She experienced Jesus for who he was in his love, his kindness, his compassion, and it changed her. This is what Christianity is about. So Paul is addressing the church because they were following rules and laws rather than Christ-likeness, which in a few minutes we'll see from our own experience how easy it is to fall into the trap of legalism. But number one in your notes, does your liberty mean you should? Does your liberty and your freedom mean you should? Verses 23 and 24. The liberty we have in Christ causes some believers to worry that Christians who do not have a series of do's and don'ts to comply with as a Christian life are likely to think that they have a liberty and a license to sin. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying you have liberty to sin because if our parameter is Christ and the parameter is the Word of God, obviously there's things in that that tell us what sin is, right? So if we're following Christ and we're obeying His Word, 
it's not the sin, right? Look at, as part of Christ's body and as a member of the household of God, God is holy and His children also should be holy. That's what Scripture says. So the Christ-likeness means we want to be holy like Christ, set apart to do His work, which is to win souls. But God desires that we live holy lives in the liberty of our free will and not by having to comply with restrictive rules of legalism. The Word of God is our guide, not the book of James Bertigue. The Word of God is our guide, not the book of Pastor PJ. The Word of God is our guide, not Tom or Mike or Patty. It's not anyone else. It's the Word of God is our guide. What would it look like? And I'm going to pick on Pastor PJ for a few moments because he got to go and see a hockey game and I didn't get to. Pastor PJ, if I went to Pastor PJ every time I had a question, every time I needed wisdom, every, any time I needed to make a decision. Now, Scripture is very clear. Seek wise counsel. For the most part, PJ is wise counsel. But is PJ going to give me 100% wise counsel all the time? I mean, every time, if I went to him and I, I made PJ my conscience, I made PJ my guide, I made PJ, PJ the right and wrong guide of my life, I made PJ my Holy Spirit, it would be the life according to Pastor PJ, not the life according to Christ. Now, where wisdom would come in from PJ is he would go, what does the Word of God say? And he would direct me back to the Word. That would be wise. But PJ is still a human being, right? So if I'm putting all my eggs into PJ's basket, I'm going to be let down at some point. Now, believers are one in Christ and should encourage to edify each other. I encourage you, if you need wise counsel, go see Pastor PJ. Okay? I'm definitely encouraging that. However, they are also falling short of the glory of God, just like I am, and they're also on their own faith journey. So they're always going to come up to a wall at some point. The liberty we have should not be a stumbling block to other believers. Which means, verse 22, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. Think about that phrase. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. What do you think he's talking about? Just think about that for a second. Think about Corinth. Think about what was going on. Think about the laws in Corinth. There is a lot of laws that give a lot of liberties, that give a lot of freedoms for people. So he's saying, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. Just because it's law doesn't mean it's necessarily helpful. The Corinthian Christians focused on their own rights and their own knowledge. They only asked one question. This is how self-focused they were. What's the harm to me? How is that going to harm me? I don't care what it does to them. What's it going to do to me? Now, fast forward 2,000 years, this is the same question we're asking. I don't care about them. Where does this affect me? This self-focused heart response is no wonder why we need more Christ. Because our hearts are toxic. Instead of asking other questions, what good can this be for me? What good could this come to other people? Right? It's, it's, it's switching our focus from our stuff to other people too. Just because something is permitted does not mean it's beneficial. Let's look at our laws today. Smoking weed. I know this is a fun one. It was open all during COVID. Smoking weed, it's lawful. It's permitted. If you're over 21, go ahead. Wait in line as long as you're wearing a mask. Go in when you want to. Grab what you need. Smoke what you want. It's lawful. Is it helpful? Well, Pastor James, you understand, you know, my doctor did say I can't. Okay, great. That's between you and your doctor. It's not between me and you. And I'm not saying if you're out there smoking weed that you're going to hell. But this is the point. Is it lawful in America, in Washington State? It is. Is it helpful? That's between you and the Lord. How about drinking? Yeah, drinking's open too, right? You could buy it. It's being taxed. No big deal. But it's a law. It's free. If you're 21, you can do it. Go ahead. You're at liberty. Smoking, it's permitted. Over 18. As long as you're over 18, go ahead and smoke all you want. If you want to go to the strip club, guess what? All you got to do is be 18. You can go. It's lawful. Go for it. How about sex? It's permitted by consenting adults over 18. Why not? 
is free. It's lawful. But is it helpful? Cussing. There is. It's permitted. No law against it. Eating meat. It's permitted at all times. If you wanted to, there's no law against it. Is it beneficial? Is it helpful? Do you see the point? James, you're going to far extremes. Well, I did bring up meat. (laughs) What was going on in Corinth isn't all that different than what's going on today. It's lawful, you can do it, but is it beneficial and is it helpful? The Corinthians did not seek the helpful things or the things that would edify each other. Essentially, instead of wanting to go forward with Jesus as much as they could, they wanted to know how much they could get away with and still be a Christian. How much can I get away with if Jesus still loves me? Now, I already told you this is a wrong approach, this is a bad theology, and it also digs up a heart issue. As a child, I was the rebel. I wanted to know what the line was. I wanted to know what happens after I cross the line. And I was raised in a church that told me what would happen if I crossed that line. If I dated, oh, it's hell. If I danced, oh, it's hell. If it was this, oh, it's hell. So I'm like, okay, so that's the line right there. Okay, mom, dad, that's the line. Okay, I'm going to do whatever I can to get as close to that close to that line as I can to find out how far I could go and still be a Christian. What ha- hard attitude is that? It's a terrible attitude. But that's terrible theology teaching a child. Oh, here's the line. Don't cross it. You cross it, you're in trouble. Okay. What would Jesus do with that situation? What did Jesus do with sinners? Well, guys... Thanks for inviting me over to this wonderful party. This is the line. You are all crossing it, and you invited me to the party. He didn't do that. What did he do? It was different. He switched it. Verse 24. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. So now it's, what about other people? Jesus walked into a party, and he's thinking about them. He's wanting to point them to him, but how how did he do it? What was his approach? As the Corinthian Christians asked the question, what's the harm to me? They did not consider the actions that might actually have harmed other people. So just because I could go and do this, is it harming people? Well, I don't care what other people think. It's all about me. Romans 14, do not cause another to stumble. What does this mean? Corinthians and some in the church be like this. If they stumble, it's on them in their own walk with God. It has nothing. It's not my problem. I don't have that problem. They do. Just because something is fine for me does not mean I should do it. My own rights or what I know to be permitted for myself are not the standards by which I judge my behavior. I must consider what is loving thing to do towards my brothers and my sisters in Jesus. And this is talking about those that are nonbelievers. So let's just talk, let's just talk normal. Can we be normal for a minute? Okay. A non-believer invites you over for dinner. Great. That's exciting. A non-believer invited you over for dinner. And they're trying to make small talk. And they're going, hey, do you watch TV? Do you watch this show? Have you seen this? And the first response is, no, my body's a temple. I don't watch things like that. I really am against it. I don't allow that to be inside my heart because I, you know, I need to be like Christ and I, you know, I, I just don't want to step out and sin. What do you think they're thinking? They have no idea what you're talking about. Right? They're like, what? Conviction? What? Spirit? What? Jesus? What? But how well were you in saying that? All of a sudden, you've now built a wall. They're never going to invite you over again. No, I'm not saying you need to go home and watch that show. I'm not saying you need to go and Netflix it. But it's one of those things where, hey, ha- have you seen this show? Ha- do you watch TV? Do you do this? Oh, actually, no, I haven't seen that show. Can you end it like that? Wow. How easy and simple that conversation was. But what we do is we project our stuff on other people. And they have no clue what we're talking about. And so Paul is like saying, look, 
I want you to go and minister the gospel to non-believers. But can you just be normal for a few moments? Like, can you be normal and have a conversation without projecting your own boundary on other people? Let's keep going. Number two on your notes. Verses 25 to 28. Eat, eat, eat is what I titled this one. Verse 25. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market. Now, we've been talking about meat sacrificed to idols for four weeks. Okay? So this is a big deal for the church in Corinth. How can Paul even say this when just in verses 20 to 21 he said, the things which the Gentiles sacrificed, they sacrificed to demons. I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot partake partake in the Lord's table and also the table of demons. Look, what Paul is saying is that the meat itself isn't infected with demons. The meat is not infected with demons. Therefore, go and eat it. Who cares? Paul is using this as a warning to not fellowship in the atmosphere with demons at the pagan temple. Big difference, right? If you're at somebody's house and they're making you steak, you don't have to go, well, actually... Where was this meat taken from? Did you buy this in the meat market from meat sacrificed idols? Because I I can't. I can't go there. That's what he's saying. What are you talking about? Paul's point was, look, if you're invited to the temple, don't go to the temple and eat the meat sacrificed idols. Don't even be in the temple. Get away from it. That's what he's saying. Now, it's not the food. The temple was the issue. The sacrifices lost their religious character when sold in the meat market. So it was permitted to eat meat that may have been sacrificed to an idol at the private table. No big deal. So when you're at a butcher shop, some of the meat was sacrificed to idols and some was not. Paul's point was, if you're not eating meat in the temple or with other pagans doing sacrifices, then have some meat. However, what if one of the brothers with a weak conscience conviction objects by saying, wait a second, that meat was sacrificed to idols? What did Paul say? He uses Psalm 24, verse 1, and he quotes it. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. The cow belonged to the Lord when it was on the hoof, and it belongs to the Lord now that it's on the barbecue. That's what he's basically saying. The food wasn't the issue. The idol worshiping was the issue. The fun fact about Psalm 24, verse 1, this is what the Jewish uh, Jewish community would pray as a blessing, actually, over every meal. So the fact that he was throwing this one in there, he was letting the Jews even know that this was okay to do. But in verse 27, if any of those who do not believe invites you to dinner, eat what is set before you. If an unbeliever invites you over for dinner, do not get into a debate about the meal and where it came from. Don't ask. It won't bother you at that point. But notice here that Paul is not prohibiting socializing with non-Christians. He actually is telling us to go and do it. This is where we can relate to this. If a non-believer invites you over, don't talk about certain things. Fun fact, probably in Christian communities, don't talk about politics. Probably not a good move. Right? There's some things you don't want to talk about at the dinner table. But what, what Paul is saying is, look, don't bring up meat. It's not an issue. Don't bring up all these other things. It's not an issue. If you're breaking bread with somebody, try to find common ground, but don't project your own religious uh, religiosity on everybody else too, right? If you have your own personal convictions, if you don't want to watch TV, don't watch TV. If you don't want to watch movies, don't watch movies. If you don't want to dance, don't dance. If you don't drink wine, don't drink wine. It's one of those things if they offer you wine and you're like, oh, no, thank you. I'll take a glass of water. Simple as that versus... Oh, would you like a glass of wine? I can't drink wine. It's against what I believe. What are you doing at that point? That's Paul's point. Fun times. Now, here's the deal. Even though you have the freedom to do so. So, for instance, verse 28, he says, But if anyone says to you, this was offered to idols, then don't eat it. So here Paul has got in mind the setting where a Christian is warning another Christian at an unbelieving host. Where it's like another Christian goes, you know what, honestly, side comment, you know what, I I do believe this meat was sacrificed to idols and I'm feeling a little bit convicted here. If they're feeling convicted, then you go, okay, all right, let's let's not eat it then. Uh, Do you guys actually have something else, if that's okay? Simple conversation versus uh, actually... My brother here just found out that that meat was sacrificed to idols at the temple, and we both together are feeling a little upset. Um, So can you just give us something else because our body's a temple? Do you see the problem 
what's going on here? He's not telling us to not have convictions. He's telling us what is it with our other brother and sister. If they're feeling convicted, then don't do it. For instance, if you drink wine, is wine a sin? No. No. Jesus turned water into wine. Now you're going to get in a debate. Well, it wasn't fermented. You know, whatever. We could talk about that later. The issue is wine is okay. But if somebody invites you over to your house and, you, and, and they ask you if you would like a glass of wine, but you know there's a brother there that struggles with addiction, then that's when you go, you know what, I'm okay. Thank you. You don't have to go, actually, I can't because my brother over here struggles with addiction and I'm here to protect him from the demons that are coming through the, the, the wine glass. Terrible idea. Don't sell out your brother in the midst of trying to stand up for righteousness. Just go, you know what? I actually am not going to do that because I don't want to cause my brother to stumble. Do you see the difference? All right. Enough about that. Final principle, number three. Verses 31 to 33. Therefore, whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all things to the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jew or to the Greek or to the church of God. Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. This is beautiful. This is the heart. This is the point. The purpose of our lives isn't to see how much we can get away with and still be considered Christians. Our goal in life is rather how do we please God? How do we please God in all that we say and all that we do? How do we please God with our politics? How do we please God with our food? How do we please God with our wine? How do we please God with our, our rights and our freedoms and our liberties? Paul says, none of, our believer, uh, none of our behavior should encourage another person to sin. Absolutely. Paul is not talking about offending the legalism of others, something he was not shy about doing. Paul's desire regarding men was that they may be saved. That's the goal. So if you get invited over to a non-believer's house, praise God. Praise God that you're even invited. Something they like about you. And they invited you over to their house. And they can't wait to give you whatever they want to give you. Maybe they drink and they can't wait to give you a glass. If you don't want it, just say, no, thank you. I'd love a soda. Great. Don't be weird. Like, embrace the unbeliever. Just have a normal conversation. If they bring up politics, say, you know what? I have my stances, but why don't we switch topics? Because I actually like you. Right? <laughs> like, just be honest, but be, be careful in what you say. Because it's not every day that we get invited. <laughs> because notice how we have buildings, and we have walls, and we have doors. They don't tend to come in here all that often because we're weird. But when we're outside these walls and they invite you over because you work with them, they must think you're pretty cool. Don't fall into sin. Keep Christ-likeness. Don't cause another man to stumble, but be Christ-like in all that you say and all that you do. Why? To God have all the glory that, he invite, that they invited us over. What would it be like if you're sitting in the car with your family and you're like, guys, let's pray before we go inside. Because our kids are going to go play with their kids. Well, I don't want their kids to rub off on my kids because they're not believers. First of all, let's pray. Okay? Let's pray in the car. Family, thank you, God, for giving us this opportunity, for allowing us to come over to hang out with the Mitchells. God, I pray that we could just be honoring to you in all that we say, all that we do. Help us not to be religious, but help us to just be normal Christians that want to follow your word. Amen. Wow! What a party! It's going to be a great deal. Okay. Paul's concern was not seeking his own profit, but that all may be saved. So here's the application. You can write this down if you want to. Will it give fellowship with God? Ask yourself this question. If I partake in this, will it give fellowship with God? Let the Lord, by the power of His Spirit, tell you. Will this glorify God? Allow the Spirit of God to bring that challenge. Will it edify other people? 
Allow God to speak to you through that. Will it be a distraction to other people and get in the way of them placing their faith in Jesus? Ask yourself these questions. No, last question, will it help save other people? And if the answer is no, then don't do it. Don't talk about it. Let's pray. Father, Paul's words at the end here says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Father, help us to imitate you. Help us to imitate you in everything we say and everything we do, in all of the opportunities that we have. Because God, I do believe that we are called to go and minister the gospel to save souls in unbelieving hearts. Father, if we get the privilege and the honor of being invited into homes, help us. Give us the words to say. Help us not to have to exit our foot from our mouth. Help us not to stand up for what we, we think are our rights and our freedoms. Help us to surrender those things to follow your leading. Help us not to conform. Help us not to step out in sin, but help us to keep your word at the forefront of our minds. But God, most of all, help us to love, to give joy, to bring peace, to act with patience and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Help us to be your image bearers. In Christ's name, amen.